Here's a rundown of the key points from quiz two. So the polis. Uh, so the polis represents something that comes out of the Greek Dark Age. It, it, it forms, it coalesces in the Greek Dark Age and represents a transformation. Uh, this is one of these questions where you want to talk about what the difference is between a polis and what comes before. Also what makes a polis distinctive because our starting point here is that uh, a polis is a city-state, but it's, it's distinctive and special. Uh, it's a particularly Greek form of city-state, and we'll come back to that in a second. So, but what is, what is involved in the formation of a polis? A polis involves taking these, these dark age farming communities that are, are thriving in the, in, the, in the strong agricultural economy of the, uh, of, the, of the dark age and that coalesce around a single agora, a single marketplace. And so this is our starting point. This coalescence, uh, which the book calls synoicism, uh, uh, this coalescence around the agora. The agora is the center, the axle, the beating heart of, of the Greek city. Um, this is the this is the first component. The 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 other major transition that this involves is uh, in the in the the dark age. We have the prominence in these these local villages and, and towns of. Of the 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 Basileus, the 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 big man, and this is represented in Iliad and Odyssey by people like uh, Odysseus, who returns to Ithaca and uh, and holds responsibility with his wife uh, for the for this community. And we see Odysseus and Penelope having complementary responsibilities for the community that they hold a duty to ensure the protection and prominence of. Um, this is the, the, the Dark Age form of the Greek king, the Basileus. And what we see is that by the time we get to the end of the Dark Age, the, the, the other prominent feature of Greek culture of the, of the Dark Age, the emergence of the idea of all the citizens being shoulder to shoulder and each of them having a voice, and this, the Greek being uh, the Greek culture being de defined by this idea of, of the free citizen is incompatible with the idea of kings. And so the, the emergence of the polis is uh, coincident with the rejection of the idea of kings. And so the polis is, is, a, is, is a community that is governed by uh, some form of elected magistrates and in which the, the, there is a elemental conflict, an elemental rivalry for determination of, of present policy and future destiny between the Aristoi, the groups of families that consider themselves to be more important because of greater property, because of greater education, um, because of their, uh, their heritage, their lineage, their blood, and the demos, the people at large, the, 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 the citizen masses. And at the heart of the polis is this, is this tension between the Aristoi and the Demos, and each polis works this out in a different way. And so this is one aspect in which one of the characteristics of the polis is that each one of them is unique and distinctive. They're distinctive in the way that the, the Aristoi and the Demos balance each other, the way that the magistrates are, are elected and from whom they are elected, and uh, the, the, the roles that different kinds of magistrates play compared to, uh, compared to assemblies, uh, compared to councils, compared to the, the expression of, of, of effort and, and voice by the Aristoi and the Demos. Each polis has a has a different algorithm, a different calculus for the relation between them, and because the history is created, change is created through friction. This is constantly changing. In in many polis, 
this, uh, this dynamic uh, shifts and transforms and, and creates something new. In Athens, where the dynamic, the tension is the strongest between Aristotle and Demos, we see over the archaic period, uh, Athens changing almost generation to generation. And uh, uh, as we'll see in, in week five, in Sparta, the opposite is true. Sparta eliminates this tension by identifying the cities and body with the Aristoi alone, by reducing the citizenship to the warrior elite and making everybody else, uh, uh, you know, non-citizens. We'll talk more about that when we talk about Sparta. But the basic idea here is the, this, this, this is a demonstration. Athens and, and Sparta are extremes of a general condition within Hellas that each polis is, is distinctive in its solutions to the, the dilemma of the balance between the individual and the community, the balance between the demos and the aristoid. Each polis is also distinctive in terms of its pursuit of the ideal. What characterizes all of Hellas is a need to find and create the ideal society and to, to drive itself toward it through arete, through, uh, through to excel beyond that which you are as individuals and as a community. This characterizes all of Hellas. All of Hellas is working toward the ideal, but each polis has its own vision of what the ideal is. Once again, this is uh, Athens and Sparta represent the extreme of this, but this is true of you know uh, you know Thebes and Corinth and and Argos and Naxos and all all the polis each has their own vision of what it is to be an ideal Greek, and to to a certain extent these are incompatible with each other and reinforce what is true from the beginning that uh, each great community is isolated from the others by you know by mountains and ocean and and as a result of this has an even fiercer local identity each polis has it has an even fiercer sense of 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 identity and self than you see in city states throughout the rest of the world i mentioned that the starting point is the city state so the, the, the formation of city-states in and of itself is worth talking about. City-states in general. Uh, what is a city-state? A city-state is an urban center surrounded by a, a, an agricultural hinterland that all together is a single economy and that is uh, self-sufficient and politically independent. So economically self-sufficient, economically uh, 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 isolated and politically self-sufficient, and this is true of the of the the Greek polis, the the self-sufficiency, and in particular the the political independence. The idea of a polis originally is is something that stands alone that cannot be governed by any larger entity. the The polis is the ultimate expression of the state in the Greek world. And you know we find that uh, as things become problematic later on, uh, this this uh, wreaks a great deal of, of difficulty and, and conflict. So the uh, the idea of the city state, uh, economically uh, self sufficient and politically independent, what else characterizes a city state? A monumental building, and we see this in the polis, usually in the form of great temples that are reserved for. The other characteristic of a city-state, which is a patron deity. Uh, each city-state chooses, uh, identifies with a particular god or goddess from a, an overall pagan pantheon and invites that god or goddess to live amongst them in a great temple that is dedicated to that particular divinity. And, uh, you know, so the, the most obvious of this in the Greek sense is Athens, which is identified with Athena and builds a great temple eventually to uh, the, the goddess Athena on its Acropolis. Um, but uh, this, is, this is true of, of all the Greek polis, that it has a patron deity and that it, it, is, uh, that it creates visual focus through a monumental building. But so these are the characteristics of a city state. The polis goes beyond that, uh, in that all city states in the ancient world are governed by kings whose role is to mediate between 
the nobles and the masses, amongst other things, and to act as a champion for the city-state in terms of the threats that come from uh, other humans and from the gods. In the, the Greek city-state, we don't have a king. And so the responsibility for that protection falls upon the community, not upon a king. And this has a great deal to do with the, the dynamic way in which each polis approaches the idea of what it is to be a citizen, the, the ideal of what a Greek citizen should be. Uh, who are the hoplites? Okay, so once again, here, you know, you get a question like, who are the hoplites? What's most, uh, uh, what's most critical about this is, why is it important to talk about the hoplites? What kind of a change do the hoplites represent? How are the hoplites a transformation from what came before? Um, so, you know, the hoplite, the citizen soldier of the archaic period and afterwards, in which uh, the, the, the Greek citizen body... All, you know, all members of the Greek citizen body, everybody that could, could afford the equipment. So this is, you know, essentially the middle class and the upper class come together to form a citizen army that is manifested through these, uh, these shields called the hoplon and uh, spears that are thrust from underneath it. Uh, the, the formation of the phalanx is representative of the role of the hoplite soldier, which is that they all stand together, they are all equal, and they are all anonymous. You can't, uh, you know, seek heroism as a hoplite soldier, because to do so is to break formation uh, and to, to doom the, the, the phalanx itself. The hoplite's uh, phalanx is, is a unity and represents the community standing together in contrast to uh, the days of, of, of yore that are talked about in the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad and the Odyssey warfare is represented by single combat, by heroes, and uh, the, the actions of cavalry and chariots uh, and so forth. Uh, all of these uh, creating opportunities for, for individuals to, uh, to turn the tide of war. Uh, hoplite warfare, the phalanx, all of the citizens stand together, wealthy, middle class, everybody that, that is, is capable of, of going out and defending. And this is representative, again, of, of the, this idea that emerges in the Dark Age and comes to, into its fruition and flourishing in the archaic period, the idea that everybody that has any amount of land has a voice in the community. They're, they're all standing together. Uh, they all have voice and agency. This is what it means to be a Greek citizen. And and uh, the, the archaic period in many ways, throughout the ancient world, especially in Greece, uh, shows us a shift from the, the few to the many, uh, a shift in the center of gravity of society from the few to the many. And so this is a big contrast from the Bronze Age. Bronze Age, uh, Aegean society is very vertical with the power at the top in the, in the hands of the Wanox. The Wanox controls everything that goes on in the palace city and particularly micromanages the economy, determines you know who the markets are and what manufactured and, uh, and how much of what to produce and so forth. And uh, uh, all that comes crashing down. All of that is a failure. And so the, the, new, the Iron Age Greek society is representative of a fundamental sea change in which the, the, the center of gravity is shifted toward the community itself. And so uh, the, the, the expulsion of the kings is represented as this, and, and the result is that uh, you know, the Greeks have possession of the responsibility for, uh, for protection. And because religion in the in amongst the the Greeks uniquely uh, doesn't involve a priestly class um, the responsibility for religion in relation to the gods also belongs to the community and not any any uh, separate set of individuals and so uh, how that plays out is different and the way the 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 struggle for control of that between the Aristoi and the demos determines much of Greek history and the transformations that take place in the archaic period and the classical period uh, the third question, so uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to talk at great length about the, uh, the readings, but uh, very briefly, uh, all of these are also representative of the transformations of the archaic period. 
Uh, the founding of Kirine. Kirine, uh, this is a story of how chaotic it is to create a, a colony, how difficult and, and all the things that can go wrong. The colonization is, that is characteristic of the archaic period is full of risk and brings about uh, a great deal of benefit for those who accomplish it successfully. Uh, in terms of their ability to be prominent in the new community and the economic uh, vibrancy that results from a successful colonization. Uh, Hesiod on labor, uh, a lot of you uh, looked at this one. It's a very famous work that talks about the virtues of, um, of hard work and how this results in benefits to you in terms of the respect of your neighbors and the benevolence of the gods. And the flip side of this is also true. If you're selfish, if you piss away all of your, your wealth, not only is that bad for you, but uh, it brings about ill repute. It brings about uh, the retribution of the gods. Uh, it damages your community. Uh, and so being a positive part of your community um, you know, uh, building a strong farm and strong relations with your neighbors and, 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 uh, and helping to contribute to that growth uh, comes back to you beneficially. This is one of those things where, you know, you talk about altruism, the, the virtues of being good is all really a, a very separate sort of form of, of selfishness because you are able to benefit from the growth and strength of the community that, that uh, results from that, not to mention, you know, the fact that you have, uh, you know, the strong farm that uh, comes from all the hard work on, on your land and the right choice of wife and all of that. Um, the beginnings of things, Hesiod's other work from Theogony, uh, the, there are, there's a lot going on here, but uh, you know one of the things that Theogony talks about is the various stages of man and how uh, Hesiod talks about how uh, the, the, the current generation of mortals is falling short of what people are capable of. Um, in terms of the gods, uh, there are a lot of things that are striking about how Hesiod views divinity. And what's most interesting to me is uh, the way that he talks about Hecate and how, uh, you know, the, the gods are in their own world and humans are in their own world. And Hecate stands between them. And so Hecate is, is the most fascinating and intriguing out of all of the gods and goddesses because she has this ability to bridge the world between the divine and the mortal. The reading on religious beliefs uh, is, is interesting because it shows anecdotally uh, the, the, the differences across time and place. Uh, religious interactions with the gods is has a lot of different components and so we see sort of personal responses we see uh, rituals and sacrifices that are involved all of these are done with a sense of how the gods are important to particular communities and the fact that this can change over time as well as being different from place to place the the readings from sappho uh, it's it's striking that we have only you know these these relatively few you know uh, fragments of of Sappho's poetry and yet Sappho stands very large over the uh, the the archaic Greek culture in retrospect and even at the at the time and this is uh, this actually has the fact that that Sappho's female is is simply a particular aspect of this Sappho is the most prominent of the the lyric poets in terms of her impact on Greek culture at the time and her impact on later historiography and the fact that she writes about you know, personal responses, uh, the fact that she writes about love, the fact that she writes so subjectively. All of these things are characteristic of lyric poetry and are evinced, uh, it, you know, as uh, paradigmatically by Sappho uh, as, if to, as if to produce exemplars of the medium that she is helping to pioneer. So one of the things I talked about in the class discussion is the fact that Sappho is talking about beautiful women is not uh, what sets her apart. 
in Greek art and literature, the exterior beauty is used as a way of indicating interior beauty as a sort of shorthand. And so we see, we have all this imagery of very beautiful men and women, you know, men and women with, with extraordinary physiques and not wearing a lot of clothing. You know, they didn't walk around like that. They weren't, you know, going around naked and, uh, and so forth. Uh, the, they were, the artists are attempting to show the human ideal in a way that can be visually represented. And this also comes across in poetry as well, uh, in reflecting this attribute of Greek art. And so, you know, the, the discussion of aesthetics as a way of, of signifying something deeper is something that is characteristic of Greek art and something that we see in, in lyric poetry. The, the fact that, uh, that Sappho is, is representing, is talking about not the functionality of marriage and the role that a man and wife can play in creating the future or uh, you know, the, the, the responsibilities that people have in terms of their society as epic poetry does, but rather talking about infatuation, um, talking about lust and these things, regardless of gender, these are the things that are most characteristic of lyric poetry and most uh, um, impactful in the way that uh, Sappho's poetry was provocative to the audiences of her time. Akouros is one of the following. Akouros is one of these statues of young men. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is a very interesting aspect of art and culture and religion, the art aspect of it is, is fascinating in and of itself, how the Kouros starts out resembling figurines from Southwest Asia and, and Egypt in terms of the you know, very formalized stance and so forth, and develops a very distinctive uh, Hellenic um, um, sense of, of movement and, and potential which is representative of a lot of things that are happening in, in Greek art, uh, especially later on. So as for the others, a large open space at the heart of the city, that's an agora. A uh, place set aside for men to exercise, that's a gymnasium. And a drinking party at which aristocratic men heard poetry recited, that's a symposium. Lyric poetry. Okay, so lyric poetry... Epic poetry, lyric poetry, um, both of these are forms of, of oral performance. So we have more written versions of, of lyric poetry because lyric poetry arises in an age of writing. And sometimes lyric poetry is written down first, but it's, 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 it's poetry for, for the Greeks. Poetry means uh, uh, songs, essentially, uh, means uh, chanted words to be performed for an audience and you know it's called lyric poetry because it was it was performed to the accompaniment of a lyre uh, a form of harp and also you know with the uh, dancing possibly other instruments so what's distinctive about lyric poetry epic poetry tells us how things are supposed to be it's uh, uh, it reinforces conventional wisdom and uh, and tradition and so in Iliad and Odyssey in particular, we see the reinforcement of ideas of how people are supposed to behave, how marriages are supposed to be, uh, how, you know, how princes and warriors are supposed to be. And this is contrasted, you know, those who act well and those who act badly. But it's all about, uh, it's all about reinforcing customs and and making sure that they are communicated forward to the next generation. That's one of the reasons why the Rhapsodes told these stories during the Dark Age to to ensure the uh, the, the health and persistence of community values from one generation to the next. Lyric poetry, instead of talking about uh, how things are supposed to be, talks about what might be. Lyric poetry is subjective and personal and speaks from the individual outward, whereas epic poetry speaks from, from the general to the individual. And, and epic poetry sort of talks from the top of society downward. Lyric poetry is, 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 is going in the other direction, talking from the individual uh, outward. 
and is is responsive, is is emotional, uh, and uh, this is this is very much fostered during this period because it's part of the the use of creative expression to to bring about reactions and stimulus in the minds of people that are hearing it uh, to bring about response to bring about new ideas uh, and and so to grow human knowledge creative and this becomes even more important in the classical period the classical period is practically defined by uh, this idea the use of creative expression to bring about the expansion of human knowledge and that's the end of the quiz. Email me with any questions.